Okay. Our last PowerPoint. All right. Good morning, everybody. I see the Zoom room is filling up. Welcome to the latest edition of the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. This morning, we're talking with Scott Perello. Scott is the Deputy District Attorney and the Head of Elder Abuse Prosecutions at the San Diego District Attorney's Office. We are looking forward to passing his story on to you in just a couple minutes. As always, we'd love to know who you are and where you're zooming in from. And uh, an additional question this morning, because this is the last at live episode of Coffee Hour, and I'll explain a little bit more about that towards the end of the program. Um, what has been your favorite memory from zooming into Coffee Hour? Again, welcome to our friends out on Facebook. Uh, we'll be getting started in just a minute or two, but let us know who you are, where you're zooming in from, and some of your favorite Coffee Hour guests and moments from our 70 plus episodes that we have done since June of 2020. As always, Paul McConaughey, a loyal coffee hour listener and watcher is zooming in this morning from Cape Cod. Good morning, Paul. The Zoom room is filling up here. It is nine o'clock, happy Valley time. We're looking forward to our conversation uh, with Scott Perello. Scott is the deputy district attorney in the San Diego district attorney's office. Good morning, Vicki Gensel from Harrisburg. And I see Ryan from Alexandria, Virginia. Welcome into coffee hour. We'll be getting started in just a minute with our conversation with Scott Perello. I see Lynn Marie DiCarlo, a frequent participant here on Coffee Hour from New Milford, New Jersey, and Carol Reyes from Schuylkill County. This is her first coffee hour. Her first coffee hour is our last coffee hour. We're going to be transitioning into a podcast format that you can download and be able to consume this wonderful content at your leisure. Uh, Schuylkill County is near and dear to our house, near and dear to my heart. My wife, Jenny, is a uh, from Schuylkill County growing up in Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. But welcome Carol to Coffee Hour. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association and welcome to the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Each week here on Coffee Hour, you have heard the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you have felt the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. As always, we are recording this session, and closed captions are available for this event. You can find that information in the chat in Zoom or in the comments on Facebook. So today we're talking with Scott Perello. Scott grew up on Long Island, New York before coming to Penn State after graduation. Um, and working in real estate and technology fields in New York for a few years. He moved out to San Diego to attend law school in 2002. Scott has now been a prosecutor for 15 years and is the head of elder abuse prosecutions for the San Diego District Attorney's Office. Scott has done more than 40 jury trials in his career covering murder, sexual assault, domestic violence, child abuse, and elder abuse. Please welcome Scott Perello to Coffee Hour. Scott, good morning, how are you? Good morning, Paul, I'm doing great out here. This, the sun hasn't come up barely here in San Diego, but it's great to be here. An early morning, 6.03 San Diego time, uh, 9.03 here, Happy Valley time. Scott, first, are you a coffee drinker or a tea guy? I am a coffee drinker. Here, I just poured myself a cup. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're looking forward to uh, talking to you and sharing your story with Penn Staters who have Zoomed in from all around the country and all around the world. But let's start at the very beginning. How did you become a Penn State Nittany Lion? Well, I became a Penn State Nittany Lion and growing up on Long Island, I made a decision, you know, I wanted to find a college that was within a, a drive. I didn't want to be flying around the country 
And uh, so I, I wanted a school with a big sports program. And I kind of drew a, a radius around Long Island and it looked like, uh, you know, schools in New England down the mid Atlantic. And my parents and I took a trip uh, my senior year. Some of you might remember it would have been uh, 1993. And we came to visit the school and there was a night game against Rutgers, a football game against Rutgers. And there was the biggest rainstorm I've ever been in in my life. And uh, my mother was begging my father and I saying, OK, we've seen the campus, you know, let's just go home. And we convinced her to put ponchos on and go into that stadium. And, you know, in weather that I thought would have scared off 60 percent of the audience, you know, the crowd. We were there in a sold out Beaver Stadium in a freezing cold rainstorm against Rutgers when Rutgers didn't, you know, they kind of had a program there for a little bit, but not in 1993. And I yeah. said, okay, this is where I'm going. And I literally did not apply to another college. I said, this is it. That's amazing. Well, I'm glad you drew the circle big enough to get <laughs> to some major programs to get it outside of Syracuse and, and UConn and Rutgers. But um, it, it was, it's, um, yeah, I, I remember those days going out to, to Penn State games and it was um, at that point, I think the stadium was about 86 to 92,000 uh, we sat. And it was 92,000 against Rutgers or 92,000 against Miami. It didn't matter who you were playing. That stadium was always packed or the weather uh, at that point as well. Scott, you came to Penn State and you got really active uh, in student organizations. Talk about some of the things you were involved in here. Yeah, the... Um... You know, I was involved in Greek life. I, I had an incredible experience uh, being part of Phi Sigma Kappa. It's out there on uh, South Allen Street. And uh, at the time in the in the 90s, we were at the height of doing what some people might remember the superstars competition. We used to take over the hub lawn and do all these uh, competitions out there and, you know, canning for thons. So I was very involved in helping to, to run the fraternity and in, in, in all those positions. And so that really dominated uh, most of my experience uh, while in Happy Valley was uh, my association in Greek life. How about some of your favorite memories from your time at Penn State? I know you were here. Uh, you said you visited in 93. You were here for some great football teams, a great football season. What are what are some of the things that stick out in your mind from your time here at Penn State? Um, well, you know, the, the football is the easy answer, right? I know right. 1994, my freshman year was the best offense in the history of college football with the right. Kerry Collins and the like. But really for me, the transition, you know, I grew up in a kind of cosmopolitan, you know, uh, upper middle class uh, town on Long Island. And so for me, my parents got a kick out of it. Uh, I, I really, I, I wanted to step outside of that comfort zone. And so I didn't go to the fraternity full of guys from Long Island. I wanted to get away right. from that. And I wound up in a fraternity with mostly guys from Western Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, I came home my first semester with a fishing license and, uh, you know, learning how to go camping and that sort of stuff. So for me, I really embraced, you know, central Pennsylvania and in the wilderness and uh, kind of the following the lead of, of uh, you know, my new fraternity brothers who were Eagle Scouts and that sort of thing. That was that was me stepping outside of the uh, comfort zone. But I remember you know, those weekends, uh, you know, away from campus, you go in canning, uh, learning about Thon and all the, those incredible traditions in, in Pennsylvania. So those are the things that I uh, usually uh, reflect back on are those, uh, those memories. Paul McConaughey, a frequent uh, participant here in our coffee hours. He was Theta Chi, which was the house right next to the Phi Sigma Kappa. He remembers the the rivalry that those two fraternities had with each other. Did that exist in your time? Oh, it was it was a fierce rivalry. And the, it was like this big dark secret that we really liked each other and wanted to, you know, it's like all these guys are right there. What we should hang out. And you had to pretend that, you know, that they were uh, the enemy. But I guess that kind of kept you kept going. It's good to have a common enemy sometimes, but they were great guys. And uh, yeah, that was uh, that was funny. So this is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. This morning, I'm joined by Scott Perello. He's the Deputy District Attorney and Head of Elder Abuse Prosecutions with the San Diego District Attorney's Office. So Scott, you graduate from Penn State. Take us through your early career. How did you go from Happy Valley to San Diego? Well, I, I 
majored in a, a major I didn't even know about. I really, I wanted to be a finance major. And my recollection was my grades were just under the cutoff. And so I went to one of my advisors at the Smeal College and they said, well, um, real estate is kind of a niche uh, major within the Smeal College of Business. Have you considered that? It's, it's just like finance, but it's focused on real estate. And I said, oh, that's incredible. My, my family's in real estate. My father was in commercial real estate at the time. And so um, that was my major, was real estate. And then I, with an emphasis on international business. And so when I got out of, uh, when I graduated uh, through some family friends, I got a job at Cushman and Wakefield, which is one of the largest commercial real estate companies in the world. And that was an incredible opportunity. And I went to work in lower Manhattan uh, in 1998 and was, uh, you know, I often joke with people, my, literally my first uh, week on the job, they sent me with a, a legal pad to the World Trade Center right. and said, go to the top floor, you know, 101 floors up and take the elevator down every floor. And it was called canvassing. We want to know every single tenant in both of those buildings. And then I got the pleasure of cold calling every single one of those hundreds of tenants, you know, to find out when their leases were expiring, if they were moving that. So that was like my crash course into New York business. And then I kind of rode this wave because at the time this dot-com bubble was huge in New York and everyone, uh, you know, stopped wearing suits and they were doing the, the tech kind of uh, business casual uh, look. And I said, that's what I need to tap into. And people were getting stock options and everyone thought we were going to be millionaires. And so I left the job in real estate to go work for one of these dot-com companies. And of course, the market crashed, right. which was the nudge I needed to uh, go to law school, which, which I thought I was going to do since I was five years old. So that was kind of the nudge. So I was 25 uh, and I had a great time, you know, living and working in Manhattan. And I uh, decided to go to law school and I picked the University of San Diego School of Law. So that's how I wound up out here. Excellent. Uh, if I recall, the University of San Diego's president, and I'm not going to remember his name right now, but um, their most recent president is a Penn State grad, uh, oh, if, really? I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, his name will come to me, uh, but he was the president at Widener University and then became the president at the University of uh, San Diego. So I never um, made that connection. I'll have to look at it. Yeah, great, great Penn State connection there as well. So, uh, you graduate from law school and then there are, well, I, I want to go back. When did you head out to San Diego? I uh, would have. So, so really the, so the, the impetus was the, the stock market crashing and then nine right. 11 really had a huge influence and a point of reflection uh, in my life of, you know, I was having fun in New York. I was, you know, doing these technology sales and I said, you right. know what, I, I'm uh, I need a life with a little more meaning. And so I had to say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna say goodbye to my friends and I'm gonna get serious. And so in the wake of 9-11, that's my, that's my baseline. You know, 2001 is when I started studying yeah. for the LSATs. Yeah, that's what I thought. 2001, 2002, you were in the, in the New York City area. Um, and and I, I was wondering if 9-11 had some impact on your decision to, you know, kind of jump back into law school and, and pursue that degree. James Harris is the president at the University of San Diego, or was the president at the University of San Diego, a, a great Penn State grad as well. So you, gra you graduate from law school. Uh, there are numerous paths you could take in terms of the, the type of law that you could practice, right? You had the real estate background, you could have gone into real estate law. What drew you to public service and to the DA's office? Yeah, it's a great question, Paul. I tell you, when leaving New York and, you know, at, at that time, you know, if you, if anyone's ever lived in New York in their early 20s, you know, there's, everyone's a stockbroker and you kind of have that, that boiler room, you know, those movies and right. all that stuff going on. So money was driving a lot of decisions and, and uh, this kind of race. And so when I decided to go to law school, uh, there's no question, I thought I was going to go try to become a corporate lawyer and, and be, uh, you know, rich and famous. That was the, the plan. And quickly, uh, when I got to Penn State or to the University of San Diego, they had a great program where they would just bring in alumni. It's the importance of an alumni association for mentorship. And because they would bring in 
lawyers, graduates from all over town. They just come in for lunches and they, you know, they buy you pizza. So you showed up and you talk to every different kind of lawyer. Like you said, there's environmental lawyers and they're uh, corporate lawyers and there's uh, real estate lawyers. And I started talking to these prosecutors that would come and, and it just seemed that there was a, a happiness to and a passion to what they were doing. And they were talking about having a work-life balance, things I had never heard of before. Right. Um, and it's interesting that there was like an epiphany. So I, I, did, I did an internship with the district attorney's office. And then that's when I really fell in love with it. But this epiphany was that I grew up in a household where my grandfather was a police detective in, in Boston for, for 40 years. And I grew up driving around in the backseat of his police car. And so for me, it was like, why didn't I see this? You know, I didn't even think of this growing up that as a continuation of that kind of culture within my family. And, you know, my uncles and aunts were all became police officers. So it was such a natural continuation. My mother used to joke when I first got my driver's license as a teenager, I would be follow. you know, if there was a, a fire truck that raced by, I would follow it. I wanted to see, right. you know, I had this voyeuristic kind of desire to see that, you know, where the police cars were going. So all of those things played into who I realized, you know, it wasn't until the age of 27 that I realized who I really was and that this is, this is exactly the, you know, the perfect profession for me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating. The, the, the things that influence your life that you don't realize until it actually influences your life, right? And to, until you're actually uh, pursuing a path that, that maybe wasn't quite apparent to you. And then you look back, right? That, the benefit of hindsight to see, you know, a lot of your experiences in, in childhood or for some people experiences through college actually positioned you to do um, what you're, what you were meant to do. No question. Talk a little bit about, um, you're the head of elder abuse prosecutions. How did you find that practice area? Um, and, and how did you find that that was eventually a kind of a passion for you and something that you wanted to pursue? Yeah. So, you know, that's another great example of the importance of mentorship. And so similarly to, to the path that I've already described, I, I was hired by the DA's office and I had no idea that elder abuse was even a, a topic that you could do as a prosecutor. Um, and we went into a, you know, a three week long training program where DA's from all over the office would come and tell you, you know, narcotics, gangs, economic crimes, sexual assault, you know, they were all are coming and telling you about their kinds of cases. And there is, I met a, a man who was a force of nature. Um, and he was, he's actually, he's from England and he all the way to San Diego. And he was, uh, he was like the godfather of elder abuse. If, you, if you're in the right. game anywhere in the country, you've heard of this guy because he goes around and teaches on it and he's real passionate about it. And for him, uh, what struck me was in his initial presentation, he talked about why he did the job and he showed pictures of his parents. So he was a generation above me. So his parents were World War II. His father was a, a bomber in the English uh, Air Force. And he talked about you know, why we need to advocate for people who can't advocate for themselves and using his parents as an example. And um, I had an incredibly close relationship with my grandparents who were all of that World War II era. Both of my grandfathers were World War II veterans. And so I watched this presentation from him and I was had the chills and I, I was in near tears. I was so inspired. And so, uh, you know, I was going to say earlier, the importance of, of trying to work for a few years before going to law school so you, so you get some real world experience. And so I had kind of that business experience. And so I just walked into his office and I said, you know, that was an incredible presentation. I was so inspired. If at any time while I'm working in this office, you have any opportunities that I could help you with, please let me know. So I just right. kind of mentioned that I was interested in that track. Now I had colleagues years later who tell me, you know, I've never said to anyone, you know, what I'd like to do in the office. I kind of just stay in my lane and I do what they tell me to do. But by me reaching out, he kind of latched onto me and I became his protege and worked as his kind of right-hand man for years. 
and he retired in 2018 and, and they let me uh, take over that position. So it was 100% mentorship and meeting uh, this incredible person who I'm still, you know, I'm still in touch with him weekly and he's become a very important part of my life. That's, and look, that's, that's uh, mentee and networking 101 right there. It's tell me about what you're doing and how you got to where you are. Um, I'm interested in hearing your story, right? That's how all these relationships, uh, the, some of these more meaningful relationships that we have in our careers begin. It's, it's about, you know, tell me your story, right? There's no um, question. Yeah. I, before we dive into your work in elder abuse, I, I want to maybe take a little bit of a sidetrack, something I've been kind of personally fascinated by that, um, you know, that you're a deputy district attorney, right? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's the same as in Pennsylvania, that the district attorney in your area is an elected position. I'm always fascinated by how some of these positions that require um, a great deal of, of highly qualified people to serve in are then popularly elected. Um, talk about kind of your interest in, in going to the next level and if that's something that you aspire to in your career. Sure. So, And if you uh, want to get into the whole politics of it, right? Because yeah. I know the, the, the public service and, and kind of advocating for people and um, the political side of it sometimes are a little bit of opposing forces. You, you've hit the nail on the head. There's some, some uh, incredible issues there. And a lot of them are, are right in the forefront, especially uh, what's happened in Philadelphia the last few years. If you're right. following uh, the def defense attorney, uh, Mr. Krasner, who was hired, there was just a big uh, PBS documentary on, on his office and and kind of those hot button issues of criminal justice reform. But to focus on, on your question, yes. Uh, we're, so we're deputy district attorneys and I forget what it is in Pennsylvania, but in a lot of places on the East Coast, they're assistant district attorneys. Everyone's got different names. But yeah, there's one elected district attorney. In San Diego, there's over 300 of us deputy district attorneys. We're actually one of the larger counties in the country and we have courthouses all around the county. So, um, and so, um, <clears throat> when you become the elected district attorney, you don't, in a large county, you don't work cases. Right. If you work in a small county, you know, there's counties in, in, in California where there's three deputy district attorneys. And so the elected DA uh, doesn't have a lot of time for politics because politics, they're doing the big murder trial. Also, um, in a big county, it's very much a political position. So I really don't enjoy the politics. Um, I love Right. Like you said, I, I love, and, and again, my, men, my mentor was one of the few who worked a full, you know, 25 year career and was still going to court on his last day in the office working cases, not kind of going into that political realm. So a lot of my uh, colleagues ascend to become judges or uh, might go on to be elected officials, but I really don't have those aspirations. I really love my interaction with with the victims of crime and working with uh, detectives um, in in developing cases, you know, I it's oversimplifying things, but I tell people, you know, I get to play cops and robbers for a living, um, right. and and yes, we see we see the absolute worst of humanity. I mean, I have cases coming across my desk of unthinkable things that um, people out in the community are privileged not to know are happening. Right. But on the other side of that, you you get to meet the victims and you see how resilient we are as as human beings. And it's very inspiring and rewarding to be the voice for someone who either is unable to speak for themselves or unable or afraid. And, and nowhere is that more present than in this field of elder abuse. So let's dive into your work in, in that field then. First, let's level set. How would you define elder abuse? Is it physical? Is it mental? Is it financial? What does it look like? Yeah, great question. Uh, elder abuse is all of those things. And it, it's it, it, the, the difficult issue sometimes for me is defining criminal elder abuse because, you know, technically if, uh, you know, it, in California, it's 65 and older. Every state, it's a little different, but really you know, eld elder abuse or, or um, elder endangerment is, is anything that is done to an elder that is causing them 
uh, physical pain, mental discomfort, if they're not getting the care that they need, you know, we call it neglect. Um, there's a whole field of self-neglect, which you have to understand as people age and want to make their own decisions, they might stop taking care of themselves. So I get uh, lots of referrals for um, people who, you know, their children or their caregivers are just being mean to them or, or not treating them well. Um, and or a, a trustee, uh, whether a family member or not, might be taking advantage of their position of trust. And so um, there are differences between civil elder abuse and criminal elder abuse. And um, so I, I do a lot of uh, kind of teaching on that point, on those points to say, I recognize you're a victim of elder abuse. You might not be in a situation that the district attorney can file a case of elder abuse, right. but I'm not saying you're not a victim. You deserve better in your life. And here are the resources. It, it's kind of a unique uh, point to be a prosecutor in elder abuse because you don't just you know, get a case from a, a police department like a you know burglary case and then okay here's all the evidence okay let's prosecute it you have to be involved with all the different agencies in your county and the state and so we call it a, a multidisciplinary approach and so i couldn't do my job without adult protective services in san diego these are close colleagues of mine i'm in touch with them weekly on the phone with their caseworkers we have meetings we round table our complicated cases because often there's an elder at risk and sometimes there's a criminal elder abuse element, but oftentimes it's not. It's where can the county, where can the community intervene? Maybe it's someone who's been in their house a little too long and they need to be placed in a facility for some reason, or they need home health. And so um, there's lots of abuse going on, but you know, we're not, I'm not looking for stats. You know, a lot of people right, right. are cynical towards prosecutors and they say, Oh, you know, they don't file cases, they can't win. That is the complete, maybe there's some offices that do that, but the culture in the San Diego district attorney's office is no one, I don't have a batting average. Right. You know, we're not looking at wins and losses. Uh, and especially for elder abuse, I'm looking for intervention. That's really what I'm looking for. Yeah. You know, some of us, you know, I mean, you practice in this world every day. Some of us hear the word abuse, right? And, and we just think, well, Abuse is abuse. So are there things that can happen to someone who is, say, 61 um, that isn't criminal, but, but uh, it happened to somebody who's 65 and older? Um, is, is age really that bar that, that puts it into um, something that might be uh, criminal uh, if it's conducted on somebody who's over 65 versus under 65? It's a great question. And so and I'm glad you highlighted that because I neglected to say in California and many states, <clears throat> it's not just elder abuse. The, the statutes that protect elders also protect what we call dependent adults. A lot of states will call it vulnerable adults. So, so my job is uh, prosecuting elder abuse, people 65 and older, and then dependent adults from age 18 to 64. Um, anyone that has any physical or mental uh, issues that make them vulnerable. And so within that lens, you're looking at anyone who requires some level of care or assistance and is taking advantage of as a result of whatever deficiency that is. So just to, so for elder or dependent adult abuse, to go back to your last question, let's just say physical abuse for us. It's, right. it's, it's defined as the infliction of physical pain or mental suffering on an elder. So if you're 61 and you're completely able-bodied and you get punched in the face walking down the street, you know, that's a battery, that's an assault, right? Uh, and in our office, you know, police will come and take a report and uh, in that case will be filed. But if you're 90 and, and I get these cases often and you're, you come down to San Diego, for those of you who have been here and you go out to dinner in the gas lamp district right. and uh, you're walking out and some schizophrenic attacks you and hits you in the back of the head. As a 90 year old, that experience is different. Um, you know, you might not wanna leave your house again. You might be so terrified. Um, you might have cognitive issues where you're confused about why that happened to you. And so 
from a customer service perspective, you deserve more in our eyes, our philosophy from law enforcement, from the police. You know, you should have a, a, a detective that is trained to understand that what sundowning is or so, you know, that maybe you need to be interviewed first thing in the morning instead of at the end of the day. You need a, a prosecutor's office who's gonna have a victim advocate who goes out to the front steps of the courthouse with a wheelchair to pick you up and bring you in because you're terrified of this whole experience. Um, and that's just a random assault. Now, if you step that up to the cases that we see more often, unfortunately, if you're asking you know, who could commit uh, physical elder abuse on an elder, most of our cases involve people with a mental health diagnosis that the suspects, and most of them are family members. So you're talking about children or, or grandchildren who have uh, most often schizophrenia or bipolar, and they're often um, dosing with, you know, uh, combining that with drugs, and they act out in terribly violent ways with their loved ones. And I, you know, I often tell people to empathize with that. I say, you know, picture the, the elder in your life that you're closest to, your grandmother, your aunt, your neighbor, uh, and you know someone who's in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, and, and picture, them, um, picture them being attacked by someone else in your life, your first cousin, someone like that. And then right. how would they turn inward towards the family? How would they react to that? Because a lot of our elders are so ashamed and embarrassed, right. they don't yeah. report. That's, that's the dynamic that... I, me and other people in my field work to overcome is that right. we know we're only hearing about one in 25 of these cases to begin with. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. And I think your example actually highlights um, a deficiency that we have in mental health care as well, right? If, if, we had, if we ramp up efforts in this country on helping those who struggle with mental health, uh, what, how does that help everybody, right? It's not just helping those who suffer from um, some of the things that you've talked about, but it also probably leads to a significant reduction in crime, right? We, all, we see some of these shootings that are associated with people with mental health. You talked about um, a lot of the abuses from uh, somebody who suffers with mental health conditions um, that are also primary caregivers. Um, and so I think that your example just highlights that. You, you know, the example that you give though of the 90 year old woman walking down the street getting hit in the head is a pretty cut and dry case, right? You, you, you have witnesses, you could see that abuse. But a lot of times I would imagine um, the abuse that you're dealing with is hidden. It's, it's not something that people see out in, in broad daylight. So what are some of the most important indicators or questions to ask um, the elderly people in our lives to see if they might be being victimized and not even realize it. I'm talking about questions that we as loved ones could ask, um, that nurse practitioners or people who are interacting with the elderly population could ask to identify um, if elder abuse is, is taking place. Yeah, thanks for that question, Paul. It's really spot on. Um, for us, the, the number one risk factor for all forms of elderly, the ones you mentioned, uh, physical, financial, um, neglect, sexual abuse, the number one risk factor is isolation. And so um, this has really been highlighted over COVID because right. elders have been at, in isolated in an unprecedented way. And so the most important thing that we could do as grandchildren, as community members, as um, just as members of, uh, of our community is to check in, is to check in with people. If you live on a block and you know that there's a single you know, widow that lives a couple houses down, you are, have no idea the, what good you're doing just by checking in and asking a few simple questions, like you said. So, um, you know, and this is someone that you might not know really well uh, to, to realize that their, their behavior is changing but it's important to check in and look at them. You know, are they as well kept as they were? Um, you know, you've grown up in that neighborhood. You've seen this woman, and she used to always have the finest uh, outfits on and have her hair uh, blown dry. And now you see her out on the front lawn, and she's disheveled. Um, right. 
her her clothes are on backwards you know something that as a little kid you may have laughed at um you want to check in and and I'll, I'll get in a moment to what how you can handle that but just simple questions of asking just about the news of the day and waiting for a response and making sure they're oriented to space and time you know i know po politics is the hot button issue but it right. seems like that's a great way to know if someone's kind of uh, aware of what's going on by saying, you know, who the president is, what, you know, what year is it? You know, some of those questions that are on that mini mental uh, e exam, uh, just checking in and, and making sure that they are able, because that person might not have family members that are checking in to say, hey, if this person might not be able to make their own decisions. And so they are becoming more and more vulnerable to what, someone knocking on the door, someone, you know, we have, tons of cases here involving unlicensed contractors that go door to door and find elder victims and convince them to write checks for, you know, oh, we're going to repave your driveway. Right. It's going to be $20,000. And, and the, the victim has no filter anymore to, to, to realize that that's an astronomical uh, price or a down payment to pay. So people get taken advantage of. Now, for people we know better that are in our lives, uh, we want to be aware of red flags, which are, are people becoming more and more withdrawn? Are they not going out? Uh, we see this is the typical pattern when someone's being abused in any way, they're going to stop going to the book club. They're going to stop going to church. Um, you know, they're not going to want to be socialized with their friends. They're going to become right. withdrawn. They're going to become uh, angry. And so that's, those are indicators that something's going on. And then depending on your relationship with that person, uh, you could start to intervene and ask questions, or that's when you need, like for that neighbor, you need to call your county's adult protective services agency. Um, you know, it's not like reporting a crime. It's, right. you just need to suspect something and say, hey, I'm concerned. My neighbor is, you know, I, I think she's uh, got some dementia and she has no one in her life. I think she's at risk or, hey, my neighbor is uh, elderly and her, I know her son is a drug addict. He's been a drug addict his whole life. And I saw he just moved into the house. Um, I think she could benefit from a welfare check. And someone from those agencies will go check in and, and just uh, to make sure. So, you know, with a family member, if you live across the state, uh, the country, um, it's very important as people get older is to check in on, you know, what I think we're going to touch on later is, Hey, you get any uh, unusual phone calls recently? Right. Um, you have any boyfriends or girlfriend? You know, these are these scammers are really whether they're knocking on the front door or calling on the phone. You want to kind of check in and listen to the things that someone's saying. If you call your grandmother, and all of a sudden she's telling you that she's got a Bitcoin account, right? You might, in one sense, you might say, "Oh, wow, cool, Grandma, you're really getting sophisticated uh, with your investing strategy," but as a prosecutor, I'm thinking, whoa, boy, some scammer has gotten into her. And I'll talk about that later. If she's buying Bitcoin, I bet she's sending you know, money overseas to some scammer. So those are the things you need to be paying attention to. And then to not you know, trust your, your senses and probe further when, when you've got one of those red flags. Yeah, well, I think we can dive into some of those examples right now, uh, because I think they're going to be tied to, you mentioned COVID-19 and people being isolated. But it also seems like that was the impetus for scammers um, and, and a variety of different scams that have popped up during COVID-19 that specifically target the elderly population. How has COVID-19 had an impact on, on your work? Um, and, and what are some of the scams that the elderly have been, um, have been victimized by? Sure. Uh, thanks, Paul. So, you know, as, as a prosecutor, it's been one of the most frustrating parts of my job uh, because, you know, I prosecute cases every day and there's bad people that target elders and I get to work with the police to have them arrested and we put them in jail. And that's, that is satisfying to get justice for those victims. There is a whole nother class of victims that it breaks my heart because I'm hearing about all the reports and there's very little that can be done on the back end. And that's because uh, of these international scammers. And it's become such a problem um, that I'll throw it out to your audience so they could think in their head, can you tell me how much money you think left 
the bank accounts of elder uh, victims in the United States last year. Paul, I'll put you on the spot. How much do you think? Throw out a number. A uh, hundred million dollars. Yeah, that's a low number. Shocking. Okay. Wow. So, so there's estimates because remember that stat I told you before, we only know about one in 25 cases. The estimates right now are between 30 and $200 billion. Wow. It's, wow. it's staggering. And the reason why is because these scammers are really good at what they do. And most of the scammers are originating in uh, Asia or the Caribbean or Canada or Nigeria. And, and they're using, you know, some of the most common scams are still the grandma grandpa scam. Uh, this is where, you know, the, the elder gets a call that they have a grandchild that's in another country that's been involved in some terrible accident and they need to pay bail money or else uh, something terrible is going to happen. Uh, we all get those phone calls from the IRS or the Social Security. Those are very common. Um, there's uh, one of the most common ones now is what we call the information technology scam, where they pose as Dell or Microsoft or the Geek Squad, and they're trying to get into your computer. Um, and you know, all these scams are the same. They're creating an emergency that is preventing the elder victim from rationally kind of hitting the pause button and realizing how preposterous this uh, scheme is. And so COVID has exemplified that because of that isolation, right? Because elders are home alone. They're not uh, bouncing these phone calls off of people as, as often. And so they're so much more susceptible to it. Um, and so COVID is only kind of exemplified and, and exaggerated this, the threat, which has been growing exponentially every year. The hundred million dollar number was was accurate three years ago. And now it's, you know, it's ballooning and ballooning. And so um, we need to be educating elders and their caregivers and family members on how these scammers are getting our money. And I mentioned uh, one of them before, um, which is kind of really next level stuff. And the scammers are studying us and, and, they're, um, and, and they're learning our behavior and they're reacting to it. And so, like I said, a, a common way for these scammers to get money now is through cryptocurrency. Right. And, and people say, oh, well, I don't have to worry about that. I have no idea what cryptocurrency is. Trust me, they could walk someone through on their laptop in minutes, how to set up an account on their Coinbase or something, you know, link in their online banking and, and the money is gone. Uh, the other way that the scammers are getting money is through gift cards. That's really right. kind of the main currency that I'd, I'd like the audience to, to understand because people see that huge wall of gift cards at, at Home Depot or Walmart, and I see such a threat there. And so that's how the scammers are getting money. They Once you fall in from one of those scams that I've talked about, um, they will tell the elders to go to Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, and buy these gift cards for $500. And then there's that little pin number on the back of the gift card. Wow. And the scammers can pull that um, numbers, you know, the money right off of that gift card as soon as they have that pin number. And that's how they're getting thousands of dollars. Um, if they're not just telling the elder, go to the bank, withdraw $20,000 and sure. FedEx it to me. So uh, this is happening. It's happening to elders that are aware of these scams. Our victims often tell me, I've even come and heard you speak. I can't believe I still fell for this. And so it's heartbreaking because oftentimes once the money is sent overseas, it's too late and we can't get it back. You know, it's, uh, we got a couple questions coming in here. Uh, one from, uh, uh, from the audience as, as a neighbor, not a family member, um, I'm astounded. I'm astounded at the shabby treatment. My 89 year old neighbors, six children are dishing out to their mother. What can I legally do to help? You know, you mentioned that there's, there's a, a standard that, um, something has to become, um, has to clear to become criminal, but there's still uh, opportunities for people to get help through their adult protective services. Talk about some of those avenues that people can pursue to help those around them. Yes. And so when, when it comes, so if, if the children are treating them so poorly that it rises to the level of neglect or physical right. elder abuse, then absolutely call the police. Don't, don't even, you know, skip that step and call the police. Uh, what I suspect is happening is that the person is just taking, is being taken advantage of. And so calling adult protective services is a, is a great idea. 
on the front end for anyone here who's who's young um like us paul and uh is planning right. you need to plan properly and and that is you know it sounds cliche but there has to be some estate plan in place especially and i can tell you because these are the phone calls i field on a weekly basis when there is a divorce and a second marriage and stepchildren um, you know, this might seem obvious because you just right. you, you hear about it or you hear about these terrible disintegrating situations. But um, once that happens, you need to lay out when you're young enough and you're cognitively aware, you need to lay out a clear vision for what should happen to your house, to your bank accounts, um, what you want to be. You know, if you want a caregiver, um, set up a trust and if you don't have family members that you can rely on, hire a fiduciary or a financial planner that can, you know, maintain your financial accounts and divvy it up the way that you want to see fit. Um, so civil, these are, you know, civil law actions that you could take to protect yourself. But also, you know, if you are older now, like uh, the person messaging in and they're seeing that these children may be all deadbeats for lack of a better term, and right. they're all taking advantage of the mom, you know, maybe the mother wants to advocate for herself. And so through talking to a civil lawyer, it's never too late, you know, as long as she has her uh, cognitive uh, abilities to create a trust, you know, someone advise her to sell her house, go find some peace and quiet and an assisted living and let these kids fend for themselves. But often the sad part is, is if you went and talked to that woman, that neighbor, I'm sure she would tell you because most of our parents would do the same thing, right? Is, oh yeah, they treat me like garbage, but what am I going to do? You know, they're all I have. So that is a very difficult dynamic. I, I was on the phone with a victim yesterday who her daughter actually crossed that line of criminal to civil and was fighting with her mother and just took a knife out and threatened her mother. Right. So terrified her right? She said, I'm going to kill you. And she held a knife. This is in a suburban area, regular family. The mom was so shaken up, but it's the first time it had happened. So I'm getting the typical victim response, which is, please, please, please don't uh, charge my daughter. It's going to ruin her life to have a criminal conviction. And what does she say? It's all my fault. I was bothering her. She was just trying to cook. And I cut her off. I said, ma'am, please, we all have mothers, we all push each other's buttons. Uh, we all have family members. What happened to you isn't normal. This, this isn't something that is excusable. You, there's no, no one deserves that level of, of abuse, right? And so there needs to be some intervention here. And if we could use the criminal justice system and we have to be compassionate too, we don't wanna ruin that daughter's life. Sure. So maybe we can intervene and say, hey, why don't you go take some anger management class? Why don't you, get some mental health counseling. Um, and, and then as a result of that, maybe we could intervene and, and save this family from that situation escalating to something terrible. You know, Scott, uh, over the past year and over the past you know, decade, really, um, the criminal justice system, system has come under scrutiny uh, as, as it relates to uh, the social justice movement, how um, how minorities are treated. How can you give us a little bit of insight on on how your department has evolved over the years, and some of the the ways that you have changed uh, your practices to help serve all communities better? Certainly. So you know, criminal justice reform is kind of the cause of the day, and and it's I think something for prosecutors to lean into, not to um, push away. Um, we have to be sensible about it, obviously. Um, my The elected district attorney in, in San Diego has been very progressive in criminal justice reform. Um, and and it, it might look different than what, um, like I mentioned before, Mr. Krasner's vision is in, in Philadelphia, but things like um, setting up diversion courts, I think are a great uh, model. So that people, again, kind of like what I just talked about, so that people aren't strapped with you know, a felony criminal record that's going to prevent them from getting jobs, but it incentivizes people that are charged with crimes to get, you know, most people that could, that commit crimes, there's some underlying issue. 
whether it's addiction or mental health. And so right. if we could get them into um, these diversionary paths where they embrace treatment and they show for two or three years that they can get jobs and take the medication that they're supposed to and go to counseling, um, then they should earn the right to have these cases stricken from their record. And so, you know, California, I think, is leading the charge. Again, the, the sinist, the, 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 if you were going to be cynical about it, you'd look right. at what the California legislature is doing and say, oh, can you believe this? They're letting people out of jail. Uh, they're changing the laws. Uh, things that used to be felonies are, are when I started, you know, at, I'm ashamed to, to kind of have been a part of, you know, that war on drugs. When I first started 15 years ago, um, people that were um, kind of selling, you know, drugs on the street would, would go to prison for many years. And now those are misdemeanors uh, in a lot of cases, you know, not for the big dealers, but for the kind of low level uh, people. So I, I think a lot of the change has been very positive and, and we have to be very cautious because we don't want the pendulum to swing so far. There's also a lot of problems that have been highlighted in some cities in California where there's just, you know, a lot of these people are falling through the cracks that used to be within the, the system and being monitored. And now they're, uh, you know, there's chronic homelessness and all this thing. So we need to find that healthy balance of criminal justice reform that makes sense, that protects our communities. I would never want to endorse a, a law or a reform that is going to make you or me or our parents or grandparents right. more susceptible to becoming the victim of a violent crime or even a financial crime, because being the victim of these crimes destroys people. We see it firsthand. They never recover. And their sense of justice is diminished when, when they come to court and, and the people that have committed these crimes aren't held responsible to a level that our victims want. And, and as a prosecutor, we're, you know, that's really what we need to be focused on is the eyes and the vantage point of our victims. And if you've ever been the victim of a crime, you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. And it's hard for people to see that side when, yeah. of course, we want to be compassionate and empathetic towards the defendants who are working to get out of, uh, you know, the, the prospect of having a conviction on their record. Yeah, I think some of these, um, some of these alternative courts that have popped up over the past few decades, whether it's those um, designed for veterans who are dealing with PTSD or or first offense drug crimes, like lower level drug crimes that have the uh, that have the focus on rehabilitation versus incarceration, um, I think have been there have been some great success stories that have kind of eliminated some kind of gateway criminal activity and kind of stopped it right there at the beginning. Um, put people on a different path. And so I think some of those examples that you gave are in line with that and are uh, great for others to consider around the country. Yeah, if you're interested, you could go to the San Diego District Attorney's website and click on the Collaborative Courts Division, right. uh, their link. And, you know, we've been at the forefront, as you probably know, San Diego is a military town, first and yeah. foremost, with the largest naval base and the Camp Pendleton out here. And so uh, we were out in front on the Veterans Court, which was an incredible program, drug court, uh, you know, and, and diversionary programs for juveniles. We've really been at the forefront and now have a, a dedicated division that our, our, like I said, our elected DA, Summer Stefan, is, has been really pushing uh, all these programs. So if you're interested to see what's going on in your jurisdiction to compare with some of these programs, uh, check out our webs, our public uh, website at the San Diego DA's office, Collaborative Court Division. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined by Scott Perello. He's the Deputy District Attorney and Head of Elder Abuse Prosecutions in the San Diego District's Attorney Office. Scott, we like to have a little bit of fun here on Coffee Hour, so I have a couple quick hitter questions to throw at you. Your favorite class at Penn State? Ooh, my favorite class, uh, <laughs> great question. My favorite class was a, a, a film or theater class. I forget, it was in the Eisenhower Auditorium right. with, a, with a few thousand other people. And we went in freshman year and watched the classic movies, Casablanca, I remember, and uh, Citizen Kane and all these incredible uh, movies. And then, you know, talked about why they were uh, cinematic masterpieces. So that stands out to me. Excellent. 
If you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? If I could have dinner with anyone, I'd, I'd have to say it would be Bono, my, uh, my rock and roll <laughs> legendary uh, uh, fan. Although, you know, I've often thought that having dinner or getting to meet one of your idols is probably a bad idea because how could they live up to Absolutely the expectations right. you have, right? Where would you take them in the red lamp or the gas lamp district? <laughs> There's some great new spots down in the gas lamp district and, uh, you know, the Padres are on fire. So I would, yeah. I would head to Pet Petco Park and bring you to a Padre game and, uh, and get to taste. Uh, they have a great new thing. All the great restaurants in San Diego have little kiosks in, uh, in Petco Park. So that's oh, where I take you. How about your most unusual we are moment, kind of an unusual or unexpected place where you heard we are? It's funny you should ask. I was on my a summer adventure to uh, to Lake Powell, which is uh, on the Utah Nevada <laughs> or Utah Arizona border, just uh, over this past summer. And I was with the kids, and we're on a hike to see uh, a huge, you know, vantage point of the Colorado River out in the middle of nowhere, just desolate uh, land there in rural Arizona. And I'm walking on the path this way, and coming the other way is some other couple and I saw the hat and I just said from a distance, you know, we are and the kids are standing with me. He said, what did you just say? So don't worry about it. You'll, you'll figure it out someday. <laughs> How about your favorite? Well, I, I don't even want to go down the, the wormhole of the Colorado River and um, the, the water shortages that I've been reading about in there. So yeah, I, let, let me just stay focused. <laughs> what is your favorite Penn State sport? Got to be football. Still a still a diehard fan, even uh, through everything that's happened since I graduated. I, I still uh, I still remember waking up. That was the one of the joys of being in the fraternity house. Is you know obviously you you think you'd be sleeping in on a Saturday morning after being up late on a Friday night, but that booming speaker of the Blue Band CD being blasted uh, at <laughs> six seven in the morning and. Uh, you know, whoever woke up first, running up and down the halls with a megaphone, getting us all excited to tailgate. I, I hear that. Bam, bam, ba, bam, bam. I hear that every Saturday morning <laughs> to this day. I wake up and that That's I'm humming amazing. that tune in my head. That's amazing. And your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? That's easy, Paul. It's the uh, it's the peanut. I forget the actual name. But it's the peanut butter, and it's got like the peanut butter ribbon woven through it. Is peanut peanut butter swirl? I've been looking my whole life trying to duplicate that. And I have not found a uh, equally as good peanut butter flavored ice cream. That's amazing. Well, Scott, I want to thank you for joining us on Coffee Hour this morning. I know it was early for you to get up with us. It appears like the sun is rising in California now, but we are so grateful that you allowed us to pass your story on to fellow Penn Staters. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Tell Jeremy Frank I said hello, okay? I will do that. Well, to you, our audience, what started as a way to engage alumni and share stories of our alumni during COVID-19 turned into a way for us to gather weekly and celebrate with fellow Nittany Lions. Today's episode is the last for coffee hour, but don't worry, we will continue to tell the stories of Penn Staters and their impact on our world in our soon-to-be-released podcast called The People of Penn State. A special thank you to you, our amazing guests, for allowing us to share your stories uh, when we share the success of alumni, it increases the value of all Penn State degrees and them allowing to share their stories has been a gift for us and we're truly grateful for that gift. I also wanna thank my team, Carrie Conlon, Carly Field, Sarah Murphy, Mel Parento, Michelle Moore, our communications team, and everyone who has been involved in bringing you coffee hour every week for the past 18 months. Finally, I want to thank you, our loyal Coffee Hour audience. Your support has been greatly appreciated, and we look forward to seeing you all in person soon. Thanks for all you do for the university, for the glory, and for the future. We are Penn State.